to this week's Money Metals podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, this week's Market Wrap, with commentary and analysis from Money Metals Exchange, the company named Best Overall Precious Metals Dealer by Investopedia. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, don't miss our exclusive interview with Greg Weldon of Weldon Financial, often dubbed the Gold Guru. Money Metals Mike Meharry and Greg cover a range of topics, including when we're likely to see a return to easy money policy from the Fed, the ramifications of rising geopolitical tensions and the weaponization of the dollar, and whether the most recent bullish trend in precious metals is likely to continue. So be sure to stick around for a fantastic conversation with our good friend Greg Weldon coming up after this week's market update. As inflation data comes in hotter than expected, markets are reassessing the outlook for rate cuts. This week's Consumer Price Index report showed the CPI rising 0.4% in February. That was the largest increase since last September. Higher gas prices and housing costs were major contributors. On an annual basis, the CPI is now rising at a 3.2% rate, well above the Federal Reserve's stated 2% inflation target. Following the CPI release, the producer price index also came in hotter than expected. Hotter than expected inflation data continues to dent hopes that the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates in the coming months. Wholesale prices jumping 0.6% on the month. That's higher than the three-tenths of a percent forecast. February PPI headline number expected to be up three-tenths of a percent. Zoom, 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 up double, up six-tenths of a percent. That would be the hottest going back to, well, equals July of last year to find a higher number. You're going back to June of 22. Inflation came in just a bit hotter than expected in February. The Labor Department says consumer prices are up more than 3% over the last year. They increased four-tenths of a percent from January to February, which means it's up slightly. Housing and gasoline costs contributed to more than 60% of those increases. Far from being in a clear trend lower, inflation is proving to be sticky. It may even be on a path higher in the months ahead. Recent price action in the gold market and commodities markets would suggest that higher manufacturing and consumer costs are coming down the pipeline. A downturn in the U.S. dollar on foreign exchange markets could exacerbate price inflation. For years, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell has publicly declared an inflation target of 2%. But some voices in Congress and within the Fed itself are calling for that target to be lifted. Raising interest rates and restricting currency supply growth in order to tame inflation would inflict too much pain on borrowers and the broader economy, they say. Rather than admit the Fed can't or won't necessarily meet its 2% inflation objective, Powell seems to be subtly redefining the objective. He is talking about progress toward the 2% target as being sufficient to justify a shift towards interest rate cuts and looser monetary policy. 2% inflation is something that may or may not actually be achieved at some indefinite time in the future. But Fed policymakers can always insist they're on the way to achieving it, someday. In the meantime, investors shouldn't count on inflation ever coming down substantially to as low as 2%. And even if it does, according to official calculations, the reported inflation rate may not reflect the full extent of real-world inflation as experienced by typical households. The decline in the U.S. dollar's purchasing power will ultimately be reflected in the gold price. Gold's performance may not perfectly match inflation in any given year, but over the long run, the precious metal can be counted on to retain its purchasing power, which means its price will continue to go up in terms of depreciating Federal Reserve notes. Of course, gold recently broke out to new record nominal highs above $2,200 an ounce. This week, the monetary metal pulled back from those highs on concerns that hot inflation may delay expected rate cuts from the Fed. It's possible we could see more backing and filling in the days ahead. Following a major breakout such as we've seen, it is normal and healthy for former resistance levels to get revisited before the uptrend continues. Gold prices currently come in at $2,173 per ounce, down 0.7% for the week. Silver is outperforming, up just over a dollar or 4.3% since last Friday's close to bring spot prices to $25.56 an ounce. The white metal technically remains in a multi-year trading range, 
But if it can break above last year's high of 2650, the charts would begin to look a lot more bullish. Turning the PGMs, platinum is up 2.9% to trade at $952. And finally, palladium is advancing 6% this week to command $1,120 per ounce. Well, now, without further delay, let's get right to our exclusive interview with Greg Weldon. Hello, this is Mike Meharry. I am an analyst and journalist working for Money Metals, and I am here today with Greg Weldon. He is the founder and CEO and president and I guess overall guru at Weldon Financial and often referred to as the gold guru. Greg, how are you? Good, and I take the garbage out at night too, so we have the whole spectrum covered here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do too. What a, what an amazing coincidence. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking a little bit of time to talk. I think this is a great time to talk about gold since we've had this uh, this little rally here over the last couple of weeks. We've seen gold hit record uh, record prices both in spot and on the future market. And uh, the the narrative, I guess, is that uh, everybody's anticipating Fed rate cuts. Inflation is beat, supposedly. And uh, so everybody is excited about getting their easy money back. And uh, and I'm sure that is part of the driver. Do you think this is what's behind this gold rally? Do you think there's a little bit more to it? I think there's I think you you nailed it. But I think there are a lot of nails to hit here. And that's one of the issues. Uh, you know, going forward, that makes it kind of exciting and yet somewhat frightening at the same time when you take in the whole from the top down picture from the geopolitical risk of that side of the world, Russia and China dominated OPEC to this side of the world, in the U.S. and what's going on in the U.S. Inter internally when you talk about the U.S. debt. But really, when you cut down to the bare bones, it's about debasement of the purchasing power of paper currencies in every corner of the planet. And the fact that gold is where it is at a time when the dollar really hasn't depreciated to me is it speaks volumes to how exciting it could be when they play the dollar card because you know they'll have to. It's not that they'll choose to, they'll be forced to at some point. And that of course is the dynamic around the Fed and the treasury money printing, the debt and the whole nine yards. So I think it, it hits on so many cylinders, it's again, uh, you you, you kind of want to say, OK, where is the how do I refute this bullish thesis? What are the reasons I could be wrong here? And they're increasingly difficult to find. And the, the one that you do find is probably the most terrifying one is that everything goes down and it's a complete debt deflation that pancakes every asset, including gold. Yeah, it's it's really an interesting time to time to be alive, as my stepdaughter often says, Um you mentioned the uh, the geopolitical. I think that's an interesting aspect that is not often discussed in the mainstream. We hear a lot about the you know Fed monetary policy. I think it's interesting just in that aspect that you know this is all based on in the anticipation of rate cuts. Yeah. We haven't actually yeah. had a rate cut, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but I've been writing a little bit about the de-dollarization, and I, I wonder if you could go a little bit more into that because I think sometimes when people hear that, and, I, and my argument is kind of that. Uh, you, you've got two things going on. You've got the depreciation of the money because of the debt and the money printing. And then you've also got the fact that the U.S. has used the dollar as a foreign policy tool. Yeah. So yeah. you've kind of got these two dynamics. But when I talk about this, a lot of people will kind of like, oh, Mike, that sounds kind of conspiracy theory cranky. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, is, is this a reasonable fear? Uh, yeah, I think it's a very tangible fear. What's interesting to me really uh, is that you have – People, especially, I mean, I'm in Palm Beach, Florida, and I'm not you know, super wealthy like some of the people in this business, some of the people that live around me. But the bottom line is these are people that are very successful in the businesses that they have you know, uh, built and then sold, most likely some of my neighbors and whatnot, retired with a lot of money. So their instincts are usually pretty sharp. And I have people asking me, like, like what do you think? Like, they're uneasy. They're feeling anxiety. And they, they kind of know why, but they can't put their finger on the bigger picture. And I think that that's so important the way you bring it up because yeah, the fear is real because the risk is real. And when you start with the kind of to chop down to the beginning of the question about the Fed and what you just saw with Fed expectations, the expectations at one point, Mike, were for six or seven rate cuts this year, which was insane. And we're saying, I'm saying this is nuts. And you know, if the stock market is where it is predicated upon that expectation being fulfilled, you have a very big risk in the stock market because it's not going to be fulfilled. And the degree to which this, to me, has to play out that you see, 
a 40-year downtrend in inflation and interest rates that is reversed in a secular fashion. That's the big problem. And what you will do is have to acquiesce to higher rates of inflation because the trend is now going to be for higher lows in inflation, higher lows in interest rates because you've turned the tide, you've reached that critical mass in money printing and debt, $307 trillion in debt globally. So then you kind of say, okay, well, the Fed's going to cut rates because at some point, you know, they will give up the fight on inflation or declare victory when they really haven't won as per their stated goals because they have to protect the economy from a debt deflation, which is a much bigger risk. Powell knows this. He's told us this. We can fight inflation with the, with the uh, Volcker playbook. What we can't fight is a Japanese style debt deflation because you need growth, growth, not just stagnation, not just flat, not just you know equal to CPI inflation growth to service the debt or it will collapse onto itself like a supernova. So that takes it to the next step. And what's the next step? Well, the next step is the geopolitical risk that exists that applies to the dollar that I don't think people quite understand applies to the dollar or are willing to even look at or recognize. Because what you just saw with the expectation for the Fed tells you how short-term instant gratification, short-term attention span this entire society, let alone the markets, has become. All right. So that's number one. So you're not looking at the big picture. You're not researching. You're not looking at the forest. You're looking at the, the, the blades of grass, for crying out loud, right? Not even the trees. And when you see the bigger picture, what you have is a financial war that's already started. It's a resource war. It's a commodity war. China is winning. They're beating our butts, man. And when you take China and Russia, ever since the Olympics, 30 trillion renminbi deal for state banks to loan money to Russia to build new pipelines. They engage Kazakhstan for natural gas. That's what kind of sparked off this whole European natural gas thing, actually, was the deal China cut with Russia. They invade Ukraine. Why? For food and ports they can ship it to China. I mean, this is a conjoined effort. I call it the new axis of, of power, if you will, when you figure that China has managed to get Shiites and Shia to talk, where you have Iran and Saudi Arabia now talking, you put OPEC, China, and Russia together on that side of the world. Europe's in big trouble, and it polarizes the world because everything is more polarized. All you got to do is look at politics. And when we're polarized in the U.S. and we're divided the way we are, we're vulnerable. And you get to the point where you know manifest destiny is Xi. Xi is, you know, his father was in the Mao regime. He's a Maoist from, from Hardy, he was indoctrinated from age six, sent off to Ivy League school in the U.S. This guy's sharp, man. He's kicking our butts, and it pains me to say that. But when you look at their, their desire to control the South China Sea, the southern Japanese islands are in play, Korea's in play, Taiwan's in play, the Philippines are in play, Vietnam's in play. I mean, just look at the shipping from the Gulf to China. How do you get there? You got to go through all these places. So at some point when they start to move militarily, we're not going to be in a position to fight them, number one, militaristically, the whole dynamic around this country. I mean, I, I think, you know, starting to draft, you probably have protests all over the place, you know, and maybe rightfully so to whatever extent. So you have a polarization in the geopolitics that is much bigger than people realize. And China will use the dollar card at some point in time. They are the largest importer and exporter every single month, 300 billion plus on both sides of that equation, where all they have to do is say, look, we're only going to accept remnant before our exports. We're only going to pay you remnant before our imports. And the dollar collapses. They won the game, so on and so forth. So that's a risk, too. Let alone you kind of come back to what we already see globally with more and more emerging market currencies that are collapsing, particularly against gold. And it sets up for the dollar to look like that three to five years from now. So, you know, look at our debt. We can talk about that for a half hour alone. So all of these things are bigger picture that are very bullish longer term outside of the potential risk that comes from a complete collapse and everything. And I think that'll happen. But that's several steps away in my mind. I think you made a really good point about the uh... – the, the kind of short-sightedness that we see, particularly in the markets. I mean, yeah. you know, they used to joke that it's a 24-hour news cycle. I think now it's about a 45-minute news cycle. You know, it's like we, we get this data release. We'll get a jobs release. And I, I'd like you to touch on that because you sent me some information yeah. about that, that that I think is interesting. But you get this jobs yeah. release and you get a headline yeah. and then everybody reacts to the headline. And then, yeah. you know, in the afternoon, yeah. you get a new headline and, and, yeah. and on and on it goes. But uh, speaking and, and of that, and not only that, let me just add, because that's absolutely true. And what's interesting is two things about that. Number one is 
you, you react to the headline, but you don't dig into the data. And the headlines, you know, people are, sh you're going to look at it on Twitter or look at it on, on Bloomberg or whatever. And, you know, it's like you miss the fact that, you know, household survey for the last two months showed employment is down. OK, everyone was championing the big rise in hourly earnings the month before the most recent report, when in fact, hours were down and weekly take home pay was deflating, you know, and it's like you just don't understand. And then what happens is you go through this period where the market is kind of reacting to these various headlines, both back and forth. And then comes a day where there'll be some kind of catalyst, little story that brings out a story that has existed for two or three or four weeks. And all of a sudden it's an epiphany and everyone realizes, oh, my God. This is now happening when, in fact, it's been happening for weeks. No one dug deep enough to find it. So you have both of these dynamics happening that create this much more herky-jerky, fast and furious, uh, and short-term movements in the markets. Yeah, and, and speaking of, of the jobs, I, I'd like to touch on that just a little bit deeper because if, if I'm just watching CNBC, my thinking is, <laughs> hey, job market's yeah. great. I mean, we, yeah. we're creating we are creating all of these jobs. Yeah. You know, Biden's great. Yeah. Um, what, what's the real story there? The real story is two things. I mean, first is the number of people unemployed is up 500,000 plus in the last 12 months. And you look at the U6, which is the total unemployment rate, uh, that is up 50 basis points uh, from a year ago. So when you take those two things in consideration and look at the breakdown, the number of jobs being created, the vast majority are part-time jobs. You'll actually have a decline of full-time jobs. And when you look at the statistics, this is one of the best ones. In the people working two full-time jobs for economic need, it's at one of the highest levels ever. And when that number gets above 350,000, every other time there's been a recession. The consumer is stressed out and you see it, number one. Number two, it's all well and good. The problem is wage growth is still at or below the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. So your check is worth less the second you get it and go to the bank to cash it, you know, theoretically in the old school vernacular. But at the same time, you know, savings are depleted. I mean, you guys look at any measure of savings is way down. What's still up from the pandemic levels? Transfers, entitlements, government handouts. It's still running four trillion annualized rate every single month. And that, that's double from anything it ever was before. So part of the problem is when you look at disposable income, it's not really keeping pace with what you might say the income numbers are suggesting. And a lot of that's coming directly from the government, a bigger percentage than ever in terms of income is coming directly from the government. So there's all way, kinds of ways. And you start to look at the household numbers where the number of unemployed is rising, the number of employed is falling, then the number of people dropping out is rising, but the labor force is falling. I mean, so the numbers are so all over the place, you can't even trust really that the, that, they're re that the bad isn't worse, let alone when people get on and say the things they say for political gain or because they need ratings or because it serves the narrative of everyone on financial television that has a vested interest in the stock market going higher. You can definitely see the stress on the consumer when you look at consumer debt. Yeah. Uh, the the most recent numbers it went up again. Credit card debt or revolving credit, which is primarily credit card debts, oh, well over a trillion dollars. Yeah. With credit well, card it? interest rates being at what 28, 29, yeah. 30 yeah. percent, people using that much debt at that high of an interest rate tells me yeah. that, that that you know that's not just oh I'm confident in the future, which is kind of the spin that you get sometimes. You're using a credit card to pay the bills is what's come down to. And not only that, what you just said is huge. And I talk about this all the time. You nailed it. It is that people are borrowing the most money ever at the most expensive cost to do so ever. What the problem is, though, Michael, is that the senior loan officer surveys have told us the one thing that uh, is going to become more difficult in terms of credit tightening is consumer loans, specifically credit cards and auto loans. And they expect that to exist for the rest of the year. All right. Look at the mortgage numbers and how many mortgages have been done at below 3% versus above 5% percent, right? You don't have like any kind of real ATM. Wages aren't growing. You don't have the growth here to keep the spending high enough to me, again, to support the debt. The other thing on this, too, is, of course, we can talk about commercial real estate. And it's finally, and that's what, another one of these stories. This has been on the books. On the, you can see in the Fed's balance sheet for weeks before all of a sudden it's headlined. And then it makes it to 60 minutes, like two months later. And everyone's like, oh, my God, commercial real estate's a problem, right? So I, I love this. It gives me a career to do, to pin out these things and dig deep into the data. 
But the other side of that is the consumer. And you would say, well, yes, delinquency rates are low historically, but the pace of increase is unprecedented, even above what happened in 2007 and 2008. So in my mind, the consumer is stressed out. You can see it. And the worst two things that really could happen in terms of the Fed and really the economy and even the stock market, number one, a consumer cocoon. And that's probably caused by number two, which is a credit crunch. And I've done a couple of specials. We call it Captain Crunch, you know, I mean, because a credit crunch would be the worst thing. And it's kind of un beginning to unfold. Well, speaking of borrowing, let's talk a little bit about the federal government. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I wrote an article today about the most recent yeah, Treasury statement, and I know that you've broken down those numbers as well. Uh, we're almost to a trillion dollars uh, for the uh, fiscal 2024 deficit, and we're only five months into the fiscal year. And I, I think the thing that really is staggering to me is the amount of money that the U.S. is now spending just to pay interest on the debt. Can you – Here's, but it's another one of those things, right? You, you talk about this, just like de-dollarization, people kind of go, eh, it's no big deal. Why should I worry about this ballooning national debt? Well, I mean, because it's we, the people that are, you know, we're, because here's why. Okay, let's, let's go to the bare bones again and cut it down to exactly what it is. And again, it pains me to say these things, but you have to, I, got, I call it like I see it, and that's what I get paid to do and, and assess risk. So, you know, I don't, I don't really worry about the political side of it because the politics are never going to fix this, okay? And the politics are so divided, we're never going to be unified again. Well, you know, our two-party system was our strength, and now it's going to be our downfall. But having said all that, it, it's a problem because let's take Social Security. Still the top number one spend, okay? Even though interest cost was up, Social Security was second in terms of the change versus last year. And what did they cut? Oh, yeah, Homeland Security got cut. Okay, well, that's number one. We'll, we'll, we won't get political, but that's a fact. Okay, fact. The problem is Social Security. What are we doing? Well, 20 and 30 year olds pay in. They know you're not going to get paid. They're never going to see that money again. That's given. We know this. It's bankrupt the system. You're using that money to give to the people that have retired and are entitled to their entitlements. It's not necessarily a bad word. The problem is politicians will come in and the second you try and fix the problem, put in a grandfather rate, people over the age of 45, whatever, not going to collect, so on and so forth, cut it off. Anyone below that has to do their own retirement from here on. Everything you put in, you lose. Well, no one wants to lose. And then the politicians will go and tell the retired people, you're going to lose your benefits, which is nothing further from the truth. It's a fraud, really. And I really shame people that, that do that. But the problem is, the biggest problem is that we are taking from the 20 and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds, taking that money in giving it to the retirees. So what are we doing? We're taking money from new investors to pay out old investors who are cashing out. If you did that as a private company, you're in prison. It's called the Ponzi scheme. It's Bernie Madoff. You know, the, you could say the dollar is the biggest Ponzi scheme in human history in that context. That's why we worry about it, because a debt deflation will result in a, you know, a depression. And when you talk about how much this economy and this, you know, just in terms of the wealth that people have, has grown from debt. You take that out of the equation, you blow us back to, you know, kind of, you know, the way that standard of living is eroded that you don't see. I remember very distinctly, I used to live in New Jersey and during the 2008 crisis, all the budgets in the municipalities, which is all of a sudden another thing that's come up out of nowhere, seemingly, right? That the Camden, New Jersey, was the second highest crime rate for its size of a city in the country. And because of budget cuts, they had to cut 40% of the police force. These are the erosions in standard of living, let alone some of the geopolitical risk that's internal here with an election where it's so divided, where the unemployment rate, let's talk on it, let's talk back to the labor market, because the unemployment rate among uh, teenagers, quote unquote teenagers, rose to 12 and a half from 10 over the last three months. You take a summer where migrants are living in these cities where there's no air conditioning, it's going to get hot, you have a political situation that's totally divided, and you got a whole bunch of teenagers unemployed and with nothing else to do. You have a setup for social unrest to the degree that it could be explosive in this country, and that's another reason to be you know, bullish on gold, dollar, dollar bearish. And the dollar bearish dynamics are, are secular in nature, because if you look at the dollar adjusted by the price of gold, it's very near a 14-year low. So, you know, I think the dollar, the dollar, the gold has done very well when the dollar has not depreciated. It's going to explode when the dollar breaks down. And it's very close to doing that. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think there's a lot of negativity towards gold and silver 
from the last couple of years because we've seen high inflation and gold has kind of been range bound, uh, the recent breakout notwithstanding. And I think there's a lot of people that are frustrated by that fact. But if you look at the dynamics, yeah. high interest rate environment, perceptions, yeah. gold's held up pretty well as far as the price goes. It has. And what you see, too, is the open interest is really low. And I've been saying this, too. It's going to break out. No one's going to be involved. They're going to chase it higher. It's going to be its own kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, I, I like to kind of quip just recently these days that, that it's kind of a reversal. It's total role reversal. But I've actually been telling people gold's going to be the next Bitcoin. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll, that'll rankle some people. Um, yeah. Let's let's bring two things together real quick, and then we'll close out. Um, we, we talked about the debt, and we've talked about the geopolitical, the de-dollarization. And I don't think a lot of people realize those things are, are connected in the sense that the U.S. needs the world to want dollars in order to keep printing dollars, right? The fact that we have the reserve currency allows the U.S., to print a lot more money than it otherwise could because there's demand for dollars out there. Can you kind of real real succinctly explain to the listener how the debt could end up tanking the dollar and vice versa, how there's kind of a, a, of a two-pronged sword here? Or two sure. edges, I guess. I mean, right yeah, no, it's right on because that's exactly the connection. I actually wrote about that this morning, in fact, that it's like, well, the budget numbers were terrible, but bond yields really aren't rising on the budget numbers because the bond market doesn't care. Why? Because they will paper it over. I mean, I wrote the book Gold Trading Bootcamp in 2006, and we called the crash in 2008, like to a T, for all the same reasons that it ultimately crashed. And in that context, I talked about monetary Armageddon, which is, again, I've, I've used this analogy a lot, so maybe people have heard this before. But it, to me, it's totally applicable. When you have the Treasury guy and the Fed guy in the bunker as if they're the two generals with the keys to the nuclear weapons, where they turn the keys simultaneously, print enough money to wipe out every paper, every dollar of debt ever issued by the U.S. government. So when you talk about that dynamic, they're not going to let the, this thing just implode upon itself. They will print more money. This is every time you're standing at the edge, staring into a deflationary abyss, every person in officialdom will print more money and choose reflation over debt deflation. Absolutely 100 percent. That's what they've been doing for, for really literally 50 years since 1971. So when you look at it that way, that is where it's like, OK, all this debt implodes. It's not going to drive interest rates necessarily higher. It's going to drive the dollar much, much lower. And that is where gold comes into the mix because it's a natural offshoot. That's even why I think there's a story to be had for crypto. I'm not like, hey, you can't own one or the other. I want to own both in most cases, all right? And frankly, I want to, you know, I think there's opportunities in all of these things, in bonds, in currencies. And I think the thing that people maybe take a little more account of is that, yes, there's been disappointment. And yes, people have kind of gotten frustrated with the metals. And yes, a lot of people have given up and thrown in the towel. And I can understand why. It's been frustrating. But I think the expectations have been a little too high, and it's just too early. And we're now entering the phase. Why? Because you've had the Pakistani rupee, the Argentinian peso. You've had the Turkish lira. You've had the Angolian Kwanzaa. I mean, you've had all the Nigerian naira. I mean, I could list the currencies that's very long against which these currencies have collapsed. And the price in gold is up anywhere from 800 to 1,500 percent over a 10 to 15 year period. OK, so it is still that store of value in all of these currencies around the world right now. That will be a movie coming to you in a theater in the U.S. in the near future. And I think that the debt is the thing that is the catalyst to cause the money printing that is the catalyst to drive the markets. You and I are exactly on the same page. I said this yesterday. The markets are going to get the easy money that they want, but yeah. not for the reason they think. You know, they yeah. think that, oh, inflation's beat. And the economy is going to soft land. Everything will be great. My theory is, is that we're going to have this debt deflation. We're going to have some type of crisis. The economy is broken. Something's going to manifest. And that's when we're going to get the easy money because that's what the Fed does. It's the fork they yeah. know is, is uh, to, to steal a term from uh, the movie Pretty Woman. So it's the, we're, stagflation, it's the stagflation theme playing out. And it really is. And we see it. It's, and it's, across, it's kind of across the world. It's in Europe. It's in the U.S. and U.K. It's in Canada. I mean, so it's a lot of places. Well, where can folks find out more from you? Where can they follow your work and uh, sure. and get more info on what you're doing? Sure, I appreciate that. Um, so anyone can email me sales, just simple sales 
which I abhor doing the sales side of this business, but that's a necessary evil. But yeah, sales at Weldon Online. That's W E L D O N, Weldon, my name, online, Weldon Online, one word, dot com. I actually just did a the last couple of reports we did. You know, we do the Gold Guru, which is a daily, and then we do other macro research. We have a lot of institutional clients. We have also individual retirees that use the research too. So, you know, for your crowd, the Gold Guru would probably be the thing. I just did a big piece yesterday on the budget. On copper, for example, we're bullish on energy, and there's a lot going on right now. And you're seeing a kind of a turn in some of these commodities, and some of these commodities have their own fundamentals that are really bullish like copper where the inventories are down 42 percent since october so in the gold group we cover uranium crypto copper base metals and gold silver platinum group and all the equities uh, and then we do quantitative work on the equities and do portfolios we do discretionary portfolio there's my choices as a cta hedge fund guy for the last 40 years uh, so sales at weldonline.com i'll send you yesterday's big weekly gold guru and uh any other information we do manage money for accredited investors i'm a registered cta been doing this for a long long time and i'll tell you i see a lot of similarities to a lot of times in the past to repeating and when you see them repeat the it becomes exponentially more volatile in dollar terms you know it's like okay well a 10 percent move now and the s p is worth a lot more money on a futures contract than it was even 10 years ago so you know Protecting the value of your money, never more important because you're going to just be in long stocks. Argentinian stock market makes a new high every every day almost. If you're not keeping pace with the debasement of the pursuing power of your money. And that's the key. And there are ways to do that. And we look to help people do that. So saleswealthandonline.com for any kind of information or a free report that we did yesterday. Outstanding. Well, and I tell people all the time, if you really want to protect your wealth, you need to look beyond, again, as we've talked about, the 45 second news cycle. We need to look at the mac the macros and the fundamentals. I don't think there are enough people doing that. So I encourage folks that are listening, go check it out, send that email, get that information because it's it's what you're not getting in the mainstream. So yeah, true. Thank you, Mike. Well, I really appreciate you taking a little bit of time to chat, and uh, we'd love to have you on again at some point as as things continue to unfold. Yeah, my pleasure. I know you guys do a great job. Say hi to Mr. Gleason for me. And uh, yeah, keep on keeping on, man. You guys rock it. We'll do it. Thank you. Well, after a few years, it was great to hear from Greg Weldon again, and I hope you enjoyed that interview. And that will do it for this week. Be sure to check back next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. And if you enjoyed that interview there, be sure to check out the Money Metals Midweek Memo hosted by Mike Meharry. I strongly encourage you to check out Mike's podcast each week if you're not already doing so. Just go to moneymetals.com forward slash podcasts or find that on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Until then, this has been Mike Gleason with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by to answer your call during business hours, Monday through Saturday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.